Next up on the broadcast, Representative Connie Rowe of Jasper is back in studio with us. Representative, welcome back to Capitol Journal. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to come talk about my bill. Indeed. And your bill, as we speak, is uh, the one that would revamp the State Board of Pardons and Paroles. You're carrying this uh, for the Attorney General, who has been a champion of this effort. He and Governor Ivey both have pushed for uh, major reforms where the Board of Pardons and Paroles is concerned. You bring a unique perspective uh, to this legislation. You have a law enforcement background. I do. Uh, I spent 27 years in law enforcement here in the state of Alabama. And in fact, um, the 22 of those years had to do with the, being in a prosecutor's office as a criminal investigator, and in which part of my job was to do the pardon and parole board prote protest for cases in our office. So, uh, so I've had many appearances before the pardon and parole board, and of course the last four years of um, my law enforcement career was spent as police chief in the city of Jasper. So I've seen these cases from where they initiate to where you get to the point of where you're just fighting to keep someone in jail who's killed someone in your community. I assume in carrying this bill that you probably agree with the Attorney General who has said that he believes the Board of Pardons and Paroles as an agency is is in desperate need of being fixed. I do agree. I agree on a personal level and as well I agree um, based on my respect for him and for our governor's office and that they have worked um, uh, diligently during the last year or almost a year uh, to correct um, uh, a series of events that have occurred and, and to find a corrective action that was suitable and uh, thus far that has that has not happened and the development of this bill I think uh, it is a uh, systematic problem and I think this bill rises to the level of addressing it appropriately. Let's remind our viewers what happened last year that this all sort of came to a head. Uh, there were some early parole considerations. Some felt there were too many. There were not victim notifications in certain cases and uh, the governor sought corrective action from, from the board. She made some leadership changes over there and she has asked the legislature to codify some of the changes she brought about in an executive order last year and that's where we are, right? True. In January of 2018, the Pardon and Parole Board saw fit uh, to release a man named Jimmy O'Neill Spencer. Uh, in July of last summer, he was in the Gunnersville uh, area and murdered three people, uh, one of whom was a seven-year-old child. Uh, following that, there were a great deal of complaints that, that came into the governor's office, that came into the attorney general's office from uh, not only victims advocates across the state, but crime victims themselves, uh, police officers, prosecutors, and then just citizens of our state who are interested in public safety for all of us. And uh, quickly it was determined that um, unfortunately there was not an elected official that was directly tied to the operations of the Board of Pardon and Parole. They uh, are, are kind of operating off to themselves. Uh, and while I would agree that the actual board who makes these quasi-judicial decisions on whom should be paroled and whom should not have parole granted uh, should be independent, and this bill would allow them to maintain that, uh, that independence off to the side. However, it would put someone in place over the business side of the Board of Pardon and Paroles that would have access to the governor, and the governor would have access to them, so that when there is a problem, like the one that involves uh, Jimmy O'Neill Spencer, and let me say that that's not the only case in which there's been a problem like this. There's a Montgomery case that's very similar that someone was telling me about this morning. There's a dozen or so that, that are similar. We need to prevent that. So when there is an outcry from the public to the governor's office or to the attorney, uh, attorney general's office, uh, if this bill is passed, there will be a path in which corrective action can be taken uh, with, with a responsibility back to the citizens of this state who have elected those officials. Among other things, the bill would give the governor appointing power uh, to appoint uh, the uh, director, correct, and, uh, and uh, have uh, some authority uh, over a person who uh, is pretty much responsible to her as the appointing uh, executive. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just like the governor has people, uh, uh, a cabinet member who's in charge of banking, who, who handles uh, commerce and banking, but, but reports to her, and there's a person that deals with prisons and a person who deals with all of the other cabinet level positions, DHR and uh, and workforce development and all those other things, there would be a person who was, the, this executive director would be responsible to the governor so that when there's a problem in a public outcry, the governor can say, what's up with that? We need to fix that. And, and, and could lord over the absolute uh, assurity that corrective actions are being taken that are appropriate at the, at the level of these um, nice people who have made some very poor decisions. Mm. 
Speaking of these nice people, uh, they have contended uh, that they don't believe there is a systemic problem within the Board of Pardons and Paroles. They admit some human error issues in some of these early parole considerations and lack of victim notifications, but they don't believe there's a systemic problem. You do, right? I do. I do. Um, and you know, when there's human error involved in um, typos in a document, human error involved in uh, several different things that I can think of, and I'm sure you can too. That's one thing. But when there is human error that is unchecked at the level that it costs three people their lives and that you can directly tie a poor decision to that outcome, then, then there has to be a way to fix that. You know, there, there are times when human error, uh, I try to cook sometimes. And I, and I, I, and I often say <laughs> to my husband, oh, I'm sorry, apparently I made a mistake. That's, that's one thing. But when you have the lives of three people taken by someone who should have never been released uh, in, in the first place, uh, they had not satisfied the 8515, which is another thing this bill addresses, which is had served 85% of the time they were sentenced, or at least 15 years. Neither one of those things had occurred, yet somehow they came up not only for a pardon and parole board hearing, they were released. And we have to correct that. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think it is uh, an intentional personal error. I think it is uh, a process error. And so we've got to change that process. And apparently the only way to do that, after several months of attempting to do that, uh, through some very civil negotiations and meetings, is to pass a bill. And this 8515 thing that I mentioned, that's actually one of, one of their rules that they have. But they chose not to follow that. This would codify that so that it's law that, yeah, you're going to serve 85% of your time or at least 15 years before you even come up for eligibility for consideration for a leniency. Mm. Uh, we had the Attorney General on the show fairly recently, and he talked about uh, this legislation. He said that during a meeting with officials with pardons and paroles after all of this came to a head, that the governor asked uh, the officials there, how do you see your role here or what are one of your main missions? And he said the reply was uh, ensuring that there's not prison overcrowding. And I think uh, that took him and the governor aback. That's what he indicated, at least the Attorney General did. Not their job. Not, not their job. You know, there's, there's, you know, you be you and let me be me. That's not their job. That's, that's not what they're responsible for. There has been before uh, we were acutely aware as we are now of an overcrowding problem, as well as the other problems that exist in our prison system. We have always had a way in which people can exit the system, and it has been through the Pardon and Parole Board. So this is a separate a, a, a very separate issue that's very important. And I was talking to somebody this morning about this bill, and what I said to them was this, is that they, they, they wanted to pull all of the things that, that deal with prisons and this bill in, into one uh, decision or one conversation. And the, the truth is, is that despite what the conditions are inside the prisons, and we certainly don't want federal overreach there, we certainly want Alabama to solve our own problems, we certainly want those things to be reconciled. But that, that has nothing to do with this process that will be in place when all of those other things that are wrong with prisons right now are corrected, and I believe that they will be, this will still either be a problem or be a solution. And while we wait for the solutions to come uh, within the state prison system, there were people who have already been released, and there are people who potentially could still be released prior to the moratorium that the governor set, who may not have acted as quickly as this bad actor did last year. It only took him a period of months. What if it's a year? We still could have people that have been released that would be capable of doing such. And it's our responsibility to make sure that doesn't happen. I personally uh, believe that it's before the legislature. We have it in position to pass and take it very, very personal that it's my responsibility to do that for the public safety of this state. You know, a lot of people don't think about Alabama being, uh, you know, a very, very dangerous place. But the truth is, is that Alabama has the si seventh highest murder rate in the U.S. Out of That's phenomenal. Mm. Where we usually rank at the bottom, the seventh highest. Additionally, FBI has ranked uh, us the fifth most dangerous state in the nation. Uh, we have to speak to that. Um, and it's bad enough that we have newborn criminals that decide to do bad things, but when we are pushing people through, pushing them out, and letting them um, uh, uh, act again, uh, the recidivism, uh, it's, it's just incredible that we could do that and not have a level of consciousness about correcting that problem. Your bill has gotten out of committee. There is an identical bill in the Senate that's also gotten out of committee. You're yes, confident that uh, the bill's headed to the, the House floor now? Uh, I, f I feel um, reasonably certain 
that, that we are headed to the House floor. We've got a, a couple of hurdles to pass to um, uh, get it in position to be selected for a calendar, uh, and I'm working on those today. But I would love to see it come to the floor. I believe leadership uh, essentially uh, supports me in that. And uh, I would love to have it uh, on the floor for debate as soon as possible. You know, there's been some talk of maybe a special session to deal with our prison problems. And I know there's been the suggestion, at least by some, that maybe this ought to be part of a special session on our prison problems. But I hear you saying it needs to be a separate track. I think we need to chisel this out. There may be a special session, there may not be a special session. But do we want to risk releasing people whom should have never been released in whatever period of time exists between now and whenever this you know, theoretical spe special session occurs, doing a bad thing? I think we're responsible for that if we do it. I don't know why we wouldn't move forward on uh, solidifying and making a good process and having it in place so that when all of these other problems are reconciled, that we can come to the point of we have a good system at the Board of Pardon and Paroles through which to release people or not to release people. Representative, we talked about accountability earlier, about the governor having uh, appointment authority and the director of the board uh, being accountable to uh, the governor. The attorney general, when he was on the show several weeks ago, mentioned that reforms were developed uh, a couple of years ago uh, for this agency and for whatever reason have not been implemented. And uh, we could hold the director accountable for those things if they were directly appointed uh, by the governor. Absolutely. You can, you can you know, tell that department to do whatever it needs to do all day long. But until you have someone with the authority to uh, supervise that, oversee that, make sure that occurs, and have some sort of repercussional action if they did not, that, that you know, you're, you're, you can write down all the lists you want to. Uh, that's, that's not going to happen. Some people might be asking, why is this agency not accountable to the governor like so many others are? And that's just the way it was set up a long time ago, and you're looking to change that. Well, I think this, I think that that the actions of the board members on deciding based on the information that they are provided, and we need to make sure that they're provided good information. I think that those that, that board does need to be independent. It doesn't need to be political. It doesn't need to be influenced by anything other than the rules or the law that apply to release uh, or, or not releasing someone. And they do need to be independent. But the practice of those three people overseeing the entire Board of Pardon and Paroles, the business side of that agency, uh, I can't imagine why they'd want to do that. It's 600 and plus employees in the state of Alabama. It's the Board of Pardon and Parole employees that are located in every judicial circuit across the state. I wouldn't want to supervise that. If I was there to make decisions uh, the to the, in the best interest of public safety, which is what they're uh, are charged with doing, what their responsibility truly is, I'd want to focus solely on making really good decisions. And I wouldn't, uh, you know, why would I want to be a part of managing all of those people and all of those functions. But we do need someone that does that, and that person needs to be uh, in a position where they answer to an elected official. The Attorney General has said as much. He thought it was too much for the board to make those critical parole decisions and run the agency. And uh, you're looking to, uh, to change that here. Absolutely. This bill, I think, is an appropriate response to, to a serious issue. The, uh, the agency has incrementally issued corrective action reports to the governor as it was mandated to do under her uh, executive order last year. They have contended they are making steps to address some of the concerns uh, that were raised. Do you think those corrective action uh, plans are going far enough? I know that in the judgment of my governor and my attorney general, they were not, and I accept that. Too little, too late. You know, you give somebody an opportunity to get squared away and they down at the rate uh, that you feel it is um, being responsive to the people of this state, and then we've got to do something else. Um, if, if they're not going to square things away in, in the way that is suitable to the governor and to the attorney general, then this should take care of it, and then we don't have to worry about that. Representative Connie Rowe of Jasper, always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much, Don. I appreciate the Thanks opportunity. Thanks for your leadership. Thank you. And Capital Journal. We'll be right back.